Hey everyone, my name is Will. Welcome to Room and Goods. There's a couple of big VR news that just came out. The game Star Wars Squadron will be released in VR, which I'm super hyped about. And there's a recent Apple AR VR headset in development that has been just recently leaked. Should Facebook Oculus be worried about Apple's new VR headset? And a quick update on Catwalk C's VR treadmill. So let's start with the Apple VR headset. If or when Apple releases the headset, this can be very disruptive in the VR market and I love it. This can actually bring some real competition for Facebook's Oculus Quest headset. If reports are true from Bloomberg, Facebook may need to step up their game on the Oculus Quest 2.0 which at the end of the day is great for consumers. It has been reported that Apple has been working on VR and AR headset for at least 5 years. And you know what? If Apple does release the headset, VR can gain some real traction and possibly go mainstream. So Bloomberg has leaked some information about Apple's top secret project. So the Apple team that is working on this top secret headset is under a department called Technology Development Group led by AR VR Vice President Mike Rockwell. At this current moment, not only that they are working on one headset, but they are actually working on two headsets. Let me explain. The first one is codenamed N421. The headset is supposedly paired with a lightweight Siri powered AR glasses. The second one which I'm really excited about is codenamed N301. This in particular is a mixed reality headset that combines best of both worlds of AR and VR. However, there seem to be some internal conflict due to clashing visions. So this is what I gathered from reading the report about the N301. Reports claim it has a lot of power behind the headset with high-end graphics and processing speeds that supposedly blows all the current headsets out of the water. However, it's so powerful that the hardware would run too hot. Therefore, Rockwell's team came up with some external hub that looked like a small Mac machine that would connect the headset to a wireless signal. But Rockwell's team did have an earlier version of the Mixed Reality headset that runs on less juice but it's independent from an external device. So Apple's formal design chief, Joni Ivey, urged that the external hub should not be part of the hardware to help it run but instead chose the less powerful device that will run independently without the support of other devices. It simply didn't fit Apple's vision about being small, lightweight, and a standalone device. This sounds a lot like they're competing with Facebook's Oculus Quest. And and supposedly, Joni also thought the N421 AR glasses was a far more superior project than the N301 and Apple CEO Tim Cook actually agreed. So apparently, there's a lot of tension for months on these projects. Therefore, Apple's developing a less powerful headset but still pretty advanced headset that displays ultra high resolution screens along with cinematic speaker systems with the possibility of a remote which will result in having the viewer or the user having a difficult time in distinguishing the virtual world from the actual real world. Bloomberg is also claiming that it will look like Facebook's current Oculus Quest but smaller. Complete with mostly fabric body, it will run on Apple Series voice assistant to control the headset and glasses along with perhaps a remote control to control the headset. In addition, it will have its own app that includes games, videos, streaming applications, and virtual conferencing, hopefully something like Engage or Spatial. The team, by the way, has over a thousand people working on this N301 AR VR project. It could announce the headset in 2021, but the release will be in 2022. And as far as the N421 AR glasses, it won't be released until at least 2023 at its earliest. I'll put a link in the description of Bloomberg if you want to read the entire article. It's definitely worth a look. So as far as Star Wars Squadron that's coming out, I think many people are super hyped about this game including myself because for one, it can actually be fully playable in VR. Although you can play in PC, the publisher has made it a point that it was designed with VR in mind from the get-go as they were developing this game. It's not some afterthought, hey guys, let's just port this into VR. And I'm actually curious if sales of the VR headset will go up because of this. Plus, there are even advantages being in VR rather than being on a PC because it's played inside a cockpit majority of the time besides the cutscenes. For instance, if you 
you are in VR, it's just much easier just to turn your head and look around the cockpit and that includes increased awareness of the elements around you. That reason alone can give you a huge advantage over a non-VR player during a dogfight. That's why I'm wondering if that would actually increase sales of VR headsets. Now the Star Wars gameplay trailer was revealed during EA livestream and looks incredible. Surprisingly, it revealed a lot of elements of gameplay. So we got ship cosmetic item customization of the interior and exterior of the ship, a huge selection of changeable components, customization of the appearance of the pilots. I can easily say I'll be pre-ordering this game because it's looking like an incredible Star Wars game. So it's a first person view space combat game in the Star Wars universe that sets after episode 6 Return of the Jedi that has a single mode and multiplayer game mode where Squadrons will go head to head in a dogfight mode or a mode called fleet battles. We'll definitely talk more about that soon. Plus it does not have any microtransactions. Everything is unlocked and earned in the game like abilities, cosmetics of the ships and additional components. So with starfighters, there are four separate ship class fighters in the game and each ship has its own capabilities. The fighter is the most versatile ship. The class includes the TIE fighter and the X-wing. Based on these stats, seems like the fighter is faster than the X-Wing, but the X-Wing is actually tougher in terms of durability. Next, the Interceptor class. This includes the tire Interceptor and the A-Wing. It's known for its speed and maneuverability that is ideal for destroying starfighters, but the tire Interceptor looks a lot faster than the A-Wing. Support ship class includes the Reaper and the U-Wing, which supports allies with supplies like health or ammo, as well as disrupting enemy fighters. And there's a Bomber class that includes the, the TIE Bomber, and the Y-Wing, which are heavy hitters of all the classes that can damage capital ships or star fighters. However, the speeds of the ships are slow. Now moving on to the cockpit. So let's start with the sensors. So the sensors will tell you what your objectives will be and location of enemy fighters. The component shows what hardware your ship contains, which also shows your ammo supply. And right above that displays your laser chart. The ship status indicator deals with your health of the ship and your shields. Combat display is a targeting system that displays information of what ship you're actually targeting and how much health they possess. Power management allows you to change where you want to focus your ship's power. You have three options, engine power which translates to speed, laser power, and shield power. And finally you have a speed indicator or throttle option which shows how fast you're actually moving. And if you notice there's a fun little easter egg in the trailer. There's actually a bobblehead on the Starfighter dashboard with the Millennium Falcon hanging off the side which I thought was a pretty cool detail. I'm actually wondering if that's actually an option. Okay next is customization. This guy will be basically your mechanic that will be assisting you on pimping out your ship. So we have options like custom paint jobs, but hopefully we can do more than just a custom paint job. Now also you can add in components with 60 different components. Some are weapons, shields, or droids, or sensors, or missiles, or boosters, all for you to add to your ship. I think this is all very exciting and impressive. I can't wait to get into the customization of the starship. It seems like you can go pretty deep with customization, but please keep in mind not all the customizations will be unlocked at the start of the game. According to EA, you have to unlock these components during gameplay by completing certain challenges. Also, not all components like the tractor beams or weapons will be available for all ship classes because it won't make any sense on certain ships like heavy weapons on the TIE interceptors because it's known for its speed. So you got seven different component slots. You got your primary weapon, two auxiliary slots that aid in repairing or engaging your enemies, countermeasures, shield, hulls, and engine. Each component offers unique advantages to each of the ship, and most of them will have trade-offs. Shield system, for example, will have better protection against blaster fire, but less against missiles. Now, it's great that you can customize your ship, but the most important element in the game is how you actually use them in battles. So during combat, this is when mastering your power management on your dashboard comes into play by adapting to situations of your squadron. During battle, you'll have to control how much you want to channel each of your components like your engine power, which is speed, laser power, which is offense, and shield strength, which is defense. Defense. This is what can separate you from other pilots or squadrons. So apparently not all starfighters will have shields, but for those who have that option, you can manually focus that shield on certain sections of the ship. For instance, you can focus it entirely to the back depending on the situation at hand. So basically, it will give you additional protection to one part of the ship's hull if someone's attacking you from behind. But it is a trade-off because it will leave, for instance, the front of your ship very vulnerable. Plus with shields, it may cause your 
ship to decrease speeds and offensive capabilities versus the unshielded ships. But the unshielded ships, for example, can quickly transfer power to the engine or blasters when they need them the most. So learning which starship performs best for you and your capabilities, plus keeping your team in mind to balance out the strength or weakness will definitely be the key to your team's success. Therefore, depending on what components you choose, it can completely modify the way your ship handles, functions, and survive. So strategy has a lot to do with how you play this game. It's just not shoot everything down dogfight. You can also not only customize one pilot, but two pilots. One from the Republic Vanguard Squadron and one from the Galactic Empire Titan Squadron. So you'll be playing two sides of the story which will give you two different perspectives of the story which will be interesting. You can be an alien species or a regular human being. So moving on, let's talk about the different battle modes. Dogfight mode is where you can go head to head with your enemy in a 5 versus 5 battle. This is where you'll be practicing your skills with various components that you have chosen. But the most interest that players will have is called fleet battle mode where 5 players on each side consisting of a bigger battle that will roll out on multi stages. So the goal is to work with your squadron to destroy a capital ship but each battle will start with a dogfight before players can actually lead an attack or defend against two medium sized capital ships and finally attack and destroy the massive flagship. This mode will also include options of playing against AI bots either solo or both or you can play with real players online so there's a lot of flexibility with this game. So when developing the gameplay EA's Motive Studio Ian Fraser who is a creative director mentioned along with his team they were determined to get the feel of Star Wars space combat as close as possible to the Star Wars movie. So this means a lot of research and a lot of testing was involved. So they did rewatch many of the Star Wars films, plus some of the aerial combat was influenced by World War II aerial combat footage, which I thought was an interesting fact. Majority of the gameplay will be played in a cockpit on an iconic Star Wars ship, which plays perfectly in VR. It will be released on October 2nd, 2020 for PC, Xbox One, and PS4, and also has crossplay support across all platforms. For PC, it will support all major headsets like HTC Vive, the Valve Index, the current PSVR, Oculus Rift, and maybe the Oculus Quest with the link cable or through virtual desktop. I say maybe because I've been searching throughout the internet confirming this, but there's no mention of it anywhere. I think it should work. It's capable of playing all Steam VR games that I tried so far. Plus, I'm curious how graphically it will look using the cable, but the processing chip is limited on the Quest, so we'll see what happens. The game will cost $39.99 US dollars the minimum system requirement on the PC to play in VR is the following but here is the recommended system requirements so guys, I want to quickly give you guys an update about the Catwalk C treadmill. If you haven't seen my previous video detailing the Catwalk C and if you're curious, you can click up here. Now the Kickstarter started on June 21st, 2020. So it was just yesterday at 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And guess what? It's already all sold out at a price of 699 US dollars with 50 backers within the hour. It was a base tier discount system where the longer you wait, the price will go up to another additional $100. So currently the 699, 799, 899 US dollars or more is all sold out. This by the way does not include any shipping fees. The only thing you can pledge now is 999 US dollars or more. It's supposed to last for 40 days and end on July 30th. Their funding goal is $100,000. The pledge will be collected after the Kickstarter campaign that will end on July 30th and if they exceed the funding goal, there will be some bonus features that will unlock for every Kickstarter backer. So hopefully this takes off. I'm sure if they are successful, other companies will jump on the bandwagon and may create their own VR treadmill. So guys, as you can tell, I can't wait to get my hands on the Star Wars game, especially because it's in VR and it's made for VR. By the way, will any of you guys be pre-ordering the game? And what do you guys think about the Apple VR AR headset situation? Which headset are you most excited about? Let me know down in the comments. As always guys, if you liked the video, press the like button and consider subscribing. Talk to y'all later.